uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, to give this presentation. Uh, this time I will be talking about one of the big challenges that I think we have in uh, natural language processing right now. And the title of my presentation is, Is My NLP Model Working? The Answer is Harder Than You Think. So I think we all know about the big progress and big news that we've seen with regards to natural language processing systems recently. Uh, to give an example, in 2018, it was reported that machine translation systems had achieved human parity on translating between Chinese and English news articles. And this is a big achievement because Chinese and English are actually very different languages. This is quite a difficult task. We've also seen huge uh, advances in language models recently, the most obvious one being GPT-3. And some people are going as far to say that GPT-3 is a replacement for Google, which is a large you know, effort for search that has been built up over many, many uh, years of engineering. There are other people who have talked to chatbots and said basically the chatbot feels like a real conversational partner and may even go as far to say that the artificial intelligence is sentient. So what is the technology powering all of these advances? Basically, it is a very simple and actually you know, very old uh, technology of language models. And essentially what language models do uh, with some simplification is they're big machine learning models where you take in some context, like being at the beginning of a sentence or a document and predict the next word. And so the language model might take this in and predict the word Vermont. Uh, you might feed the word Vermont into the language model, uh, then get the word is, and then step through the sentence, get Vermont is a state in the Northeast US. And then you would calculate the end of the sentence and, and be done with whatever your output wanted to be. So as I said, this is very, very simple, uh, both uh, from the point of view of the task, and it's relatively simple from the point of view of the model itself. Usually we're just using a big neural network, uh, something called a transformer model, if you're familiar with the terminology. But uh, the incredible thing is the idea is very, very simple. But if you train a model with you know, 150 billion or 500 billion parameters on terabytes of data from the internet, it can actually do pretty impressive and amazing things. So I feel that this has really opened up a new paradigm in natural language processing. And the paradigm in natural language processing is solving NLP tasks from the point of view of text generation using language models and a technique called prompting. And what I mean by prompting is we have a certain prefix that we feed into the model, uh, such as Q, what is the capital of Pennsylvania, question mark, and then A, like question and answer. We put this into the language model, and just about any language model that we have nowadays, even the, the smaller ones or the ones that we think of as being less capable, would accu accurately predict this fact to be Harrisburg. And it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't stop at simple question answering. It can also do more complicated things. So for example, I took an article from uh, someplace, I think maybe text, text French, and took the first paragraph of it and copy pasted it into a language model text box, then added TLDR for too long didn't read. And so the language model output. And in fact, uh, this was a very short and concise summary uh, explaining about this, you know, what this article originally said. And one interesting thing to note is that all of the language models that I was using were certainly trained uh, before Elon Musk had bought uh, Twitter. And so because of this, we can see that this language model is clearly, you know, abstracting to not just kind of constant information that is included in its training data, but also new things like being able to summarize. And this is without explicitly training the model to summarize either. 
So how good is generated text? How impressive uh, can the results from this paradigm be? So uh, this is an example from a, a nice Twitter thread from GPT-3 versus Google Search by David Weekly. And basically what it says is, how do the muscles in your arm work? And the answers say the muscles in your arm work by contracting and pulling on the bones in your arm. This movement is possible because the muscles are attached to the bones by tendons. Very nice and concise description. Another thing is, why do we sleep? Why do we dream? And notably, this is actually two questions. And you know, many places in the internet wouldn't uh, be covering both of these answers together. And because of this, actually, Google search wasn't able to answer both of them uh, in a single go. But if we feed this into uh, GPT-3, we can see we sleep to give our bodies and brains a chance to rest and repair themselves. Uh, dreams may help us process and store memories, or they may be a way for our brains to work through problems in, or anxiety. So pretty impressive, right? You know, it's uh, giving a good, concise answer that is actually true. However, at the same time, uh, there are still major problems, even in the best, strongest models that we have at the moment. And just to give a few examples, uh, I asked the question just a few days ago, what are the largest states in the US by population and surface area? So this is kind of like a why do we sleep, why do we dream style question where I'm asking two questions in one. And the answer that I got was Alaska and Texas. And this is not true. Uh, the largest state by population is California, of course. So, uh, However, the model gave no indication that this is false. It answered it very confidently. And I think this is probably one of the biggest issues with uh, these models nowadays is that they give you very nice outputs, but we just don't know if those outputs are correct or not. Just to give another example, uh, what is the net worth of the CEO of Twitter following the news that I uh, just posted before? And I put it in uh, and it gave me the answer, Jack Dorsey is the CEO of Twitter. He is worth 2.5 billion. And uh, both of these are not correct. So uh, we can see that, again, it's answered us very confidently, but it has problems with factuality. Um, some other examples, we can have problems with coherence or plausibility. And so I, I prompted the model with, this is a story about a programmer on her first day of work. And essentially the model followed up with a story that says she was given a task to write a program that would print the numbers from one to 100, but for multiples of three, print fizz instead of the number, and for the multiples of five, print buzz. For numbers which are multiples of both three and five, print fizz buzz. Um, I, I think this is interesting because this is actually a very, if you're not familiar, this is a very common interview question for programmers, but it's definitely not something you would be asked to do on the first day of your work. Uh, or if you are, then you probably should be looking for a different workplace. The model then continued, uh, she was given a week to complete the task, uh, and uh, that's even more of a red flag, but then it continued th two more times to say uh, she was given a week to complete the task. So basically what you can see is, you know, it, it did a good job of, of maybe topical correctness for, to some extent, but it's not plausible, it's not coherent, it repeats itself and other issues like this. So um, there are certainly, you know, the models that we have right now are not ready uh, to, you know, completely take over uh, any intelligent task. Some people uh, may think they are able to. However, this also leads to a problem. Like, as I mentioned before, a generated task can look very nice, even when it's completely wrong. And so because of this, I would say that unlike, you know, several years ago where we had some pretty good metrics for how um, generated task, the text, what, how, what the quality of generated text is. Now, I think we're almost in the place where evaluating the text that we generate is about as hard as generating it in the first place. And so because of this, uh, I think this is actually becoming a pretty big bottleneck in the pipeline of developing reliable NLP systems. And so if we look back at the way we normally develop a system, we have training data. Um, we use the training data to build a system. We get testing data for the system in some way. 
uh, we do evaluation using that testing data. Uh, based on the evaluation, we might get new ideas and improve our system and go in a circle like this until we get to the level of accuracy that we think we need for whatever purpose we're building the system for. Um, but here, this getting the evaluation results is actually a pretty, uh, pretty big bottleneck. So how do we tell if a system, uh, NLP system, or in particular text generation based NLP system is doing well? So the gold standard of doing this is through manual evaluation, where essentially we have a source, we have a couple hypotheses. Uh, we get an annotator who looks at the text from these hypotheses and then uh, basically gives them a score. And you know maybe they give a score of 0 0.8 to a relatively good hypothesis, and they give a score of 0 0.5 to a less good hypothesis. What exactly these scores stand for uh, depends on the task that you're trying to solve. Uh, some examples of this could be fluency, you know, how natural is the output from the point of view of uh, fluency, um, uh, kind of like the naturalness of the language itself, uh, factuality, so how factual is the answer uh, to whatever source text you had or uh, to the real world. Another thing that you could be doing is coherence, so, you know, is a long-term document, is a long document is the information flowing through in a coherent way so that it's easy to read and the logical connections are clear. So I'm going to be relatively agnostic to what exactly we pick here uh, as our human evaluation metric, but uh, we can know uh, that this is the case. One issue, there's several issues with this. The first and maybe most obvious issue is that this is time consuming and uh, costs money to hire people to do this. Uh, the second, maybe less obvious issue is that actually, if a human is not trained very well, or if they don't care very well, the, very much, or something like this, then actually they might not do a very good job. Uh, and right now, it, human evaluation quality is also kind of one of the bottlenecks uh, from the point of view of developing systems. It's not that they wouldn't be able to do a good job if they didn't uh, if they had the motivation, but you, you hire some uh, random people online, they might want to do just as good, a good enough job to get paid for what they're being paid to do. And then the quality of your human uh, annotation is not very good. But for the time being, let's assume we've gotten, you know, uh, good annotators who are motivated enough to give us good scores. And if that's the case, then we can treat these scores as kind of the gold standard that we'd want to predict with any other method that we might be using. So uh, the other method that we might be using is automatic evaluation. And automatic evaluation, essentially, we want to replace uh, the work that the human annotators are doing with an automatic system. And so the automatic system will certainly take in the source material and the various hypotheses that we get from each of the systems. It might additionally take in a reference where the reference is a human generated output that kind of serves as an example of what the outputs should look like if they were done in an appropriate way. So for translation, it might be a translation by a human translator. So then given these inputs, uh, we then feed them through an automatic system that tries to predict uh, the same scores that we would be asking a human for, regardless of what those scores are. So the old way of doing this and the relatively reliable, simple, uh, easy to understand way of doing this is uh, blue score or rouge score. Uh, you might he have heard of these before if you work on NLP and they're very widely used for machine translation and summarization respectively. And the way they work is you take in a reference and given the reference, uh, like I am giving a talk at a data science conference, you might get a hypothesis that says I am giving a talk at a conference about data science. And another hypothesis that says this is a talk about recent advances in medical imaging. So then these metrics, what they do is they look at the sequences of tokens that overlap with the reference. So here I am giving a talk at a uh, overlaps with the reference, conference overlaps, and data science overlaps, about does not overlap. 
And basically we look at this and we say there's high overlap between these two, so we should be giving a high score to this. On the other hand, if we have little overlap, uh, we will get a low score. However, uh, why is this hard? Uh, this is hard for a couple reasons, and it's hard because it's possible to overestimate the quality of outputs and underestimate the quality of outputs. So here we have the same reference. I'm giving a talk at a data science conference, but let's say our hypothesis is I'm giving a talk at a political science conference. So there's lots of overlap here, uh, but nonetheless, this is a bad output. And it's a bad output because we got basically the most important content in the sentence wrong. Um, you know, the main nouns in the sentence or the main verbs in the sentence, if we get them just completely off, then uh, that could be a very bad example. On the other hand, we might have something like my lecture will be given to the meeting on data analytics. Uh, sure, data analytics is a little bit from different from data science, but you know, maybe close enough. Um, and here, the only word in the entire sentence that overlaps is data, but uh, overall, it's much, much better uh, from the point of view of semantics anyway, uh, than giving a talk at a political science conference. So we can see that uh, even little overlap ones, if they're paraphrased in some way, you can get a good output. And this is particularly difficult for open-ended problems. So just to give an example, let's say we're doing a dialogue system. We're doing a system that's uh, a chat bot that's supposed to chat with users and essentially have them uh, enjoy themselves so they stick around on, on your site or something like this. And in, if that's the case, if you ask, hey, how are you doing today? Or, hey, what are you doing today? There's a bunch of different answers that would be perfectly reasonable. Like, um, you know, I'm going, I'm planning on going to a concert and I'm really excited about it, or I'm completely overwhelmed with my uh, homework and feeling quite nervous or something. And these, you know, would be very different from the point of view of surface overlap, but still nonetheless uh, quite reasonable. So recently in the field, there's been a big transition over the past couple of years to uh, embedding-based evaluation using learned NLP models to evaluate NLP models themselves. And one example of this is a method called BERT score. And the way BERT score works is we get a reference and a candidate uh, output. We run them through a language model. And uh, in this particular case, they used a, a famous language model called BERT, uh, but it could be any other language model, really. And they get the hidden neural network representations corresponding to each of the words in the sentence. So this is an example of the uh, the representations, so maybe uh, we have the weather is cold today, and these representations would be for the weather is cold today, and it is freezing today, it is freezing today. And then we calculate the cosine similarity over all of these. So, um, for example, weather and freezing might have relatively good co uh, cosine similarity, uh, cold and freezing might have good similarity, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, after we do this, then the next thing that we do is we find the best match uh, between any particular word in the output and the words in the input, and we use that as the score of the word. So if every word has a good match in the output, then you'll get a high score. If no words have, a, or very few words have a good match in the output, uh, you'll get a low score, or sorry, between the output and the, the reference. In addition, they do another thing, which is essentially they calculate weights for the importance of each word in the sentence so that less frequent words will get higher uh, weights because those are the words that tend to be important. And that would help uh, resolve the issue of, for example, a very important word uh, being underweighted in the traditional uh, string match metric like blue or rouge. So once we've done this, we run them through an equation. It's not really important what the equation is, but it, basically it's the weighted average of the cosine similarities. And based on that, we get a score, and that's our score of our output. So this solves a couple of the problems that I talked about before. For example, it is much better at handling paraphrases because even something like freezing and cold 
can nonetheless get a high score if they're close together in this language model embedding space. Uh, since BERT score came to, out, there's been a number of uh, further advances. One really big advance in the field is that now we're using metrics where we learn how to evaluate. And the way this works is basically we have uh, examples. We ask our human annotators to annotate the examples and give us a score here. And then we also run the example through an evaluation metric. And this is, in, in particular, I'm talking about a evaluation metric called Comet, but there's other uh, similar ones that we use. And so let's say Comet outputs a score of 0 0.1, which is rather far from the score that the human annotator gave. What we then do is we calculate the difference between them and we use this as a loss function uh, where the loss function, if the loss is high, we go in and update the model aggressively and we feed back the information from this difference to go and update Comet so that it doesn't make the same mistake next time. And Comet is now kind of one of the state of the art models for evaluating machine translation output, uh, pretty widely used in the machine translation field. And there's other uh, methods that are used for other tasks, like there's a method called BlueArt, which is also used for uh, summarization. So the next one um, I'd like to talk about is generative text evaluation. And generative text evaluation, uh, I know we've heard a lot about generative AI recently. And basically, this is a method that uses uh, generative models to evaluate text. And this is a, a paper by us, uh, I'd be very happy to answer you know, more detailed questions about it if people are interested in it. And basically the way it works is we train another model uh, that is able to do things like predict the probability of the hypothesis given the source, predict the probability of the source given the hypothesis, the reference given the, or the hypothesis given the reference, and the, um, the reference given the hypothesis. And all of these, probabilities essentially capture different types of information about how good the output is. So for example, uh, these ones capture information about how well the output matches with uh, the original input. And these ones are kind of like paraphrase scores that measure how closely the hypothesis uh, paraphrases the reference. So uh, then next, I'd like to go into how we evaluate evaluation. And the way we evaluate evaluation is essentially we create a large test set, a large uh, database of human scores. So we might have like four different outputs or 400 different outputs where each one of them is given a traditional um, kind of given uh, human scores. And then we have an automatic metric where the automatic metric essentially predicts all of these scores. And what we would hope is this automatic metric is a good match for the human metrics. So based on this, we simply calculate the correlation between these two quantities. And the higher the correlation, the better uh, the model is. One caveat I should mention is that even among humans, the agreement is not perfect. So the correlations here might be a bit lower than the correlations that you would be used to be seeing. But still, that doesn't mean that the metric is bad. It just means that the, the task is hard and even human labeling can be inconsistent some of the time. So with respect to uh, meta-evaluation, uh, th and this is called meta-evaluation. This evaluation of evaluation metrics is called meta-evaluation. And uh, here I have some meta-evaluation results. And basically what you can see here is BART score, the generative AI model that I talked about for evaluating uh, how well text generation systems are doing is quite a bit better with respect to correlation. It's much better with respect to summarization fluency. It's much better with respect to summarization factuality uh, for data to text generation systems uh, that you use in like generation for dialogue or other tasks like this. It's a bit better with respect to informativeness. And then for translation quality estimation, it's very good. It's on par uh, with Comet, where Comet is trained using human annotations, whereas this BART score metric is not. It's just trained on uh, its ability to translate between um, 
or to convert between two uh, inputs and outputs, either the source in the hypothesis or the reference in the hypothesis. So I see I had a question in the chat. Uh, thank you for the question. And the question is, are there approaches to evaluate NLP models based on traditional language sciences, such as English grammar, parse trees, and linguistics? This is a very good question. Um, and I think from the point of view of evaluating English text, there were metrics like this uh, that use things like semantic uh, role labeling, where semantic role labeling is trying to identify like who said what to whom and identify when important semantic information is missing. Uh, right now, I think all of the state of the art methods are not using this type of information. Instead, they're focusing on learned methods, uh, mostly because they're easier, but also uh, easier to apply. They don't require you know, grammar engineering or other things like that. Um, however, I do think that at some point, uh, we probably are going to have to revisit these things because uh, the models that we have won't be able to capture everything. And another thing that I think we're going to need to do, which will be a very good segue into my next part, is I think using this from the point of view of more fine-grained analysis of where the model is working and failing is, uh, is certainly an important idea. So moving on to the next section, um, as I said, uh, one part of the process is getting ideas about what to do next and how to you know, further improve your system or, or fix any issues that it has. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about NLP debugging methods, like methods that we use or methods that we're also hoping that other people will be able to use to more quickly understand where your system is failing so you can focus on those areas to help uh, improve it. So let's say you have an evaluation number. Um, where do you go next? So we have two main tools. Uh, one tool is fine-grained aggregate analysis. Um, and just to give an example of what this could do, this could be telling us your model is underperforming on short sentences. Um, another thing would be looking at individual case studies. And so basically, uh, you know, if we could identify this is a potentially incorrect sentence, you could then go in and look at it, say, oh, I see that the model has dropped the word great, which seems very important to the sentence. And then, you know, if you're well-versed in NLP techniques, you could uh, figure out how to fix that, either by, you know, adding data, modifying your model, uh, modifying your inference algorithm, et cetera. And um, so I think both of these are, are very useful tools, and I'm going to explain a little bit about how we, uh, we use them in our work as well and how I hope that other people can. So doing a case study, I'm going to look at Russian English translation results where we have a translation system. And uh, as I mentioned before, we now have a bunch of different evaluation metrics. Uh, here I've listed four of them. Uh, so one is blue score, one is uh, character F measure, uh, another one is Comet, which I talked about before, and another one is Word uh, F1 score, which is basically the accuracy of the scores. Um, you can ignore the character F measure part for here, but basically one interesting thing you can see is that blue score, the older evaluation metric based on exact match, is detecting very little difference between these systems, whereas Comet score is actually detecting a a uh, reasonably sized difference between the systems and saying that the green system is better than the, the blue system. So I think this is an interesting thing to note um, that basically newer evaluation metrics are particularly important for kind of evaluating new systems and telling the difference between them because the mistakes that these systems make tend to be very small ones that aren't well measured by kind of surface level word overlap features, but might be captured by these learned metrics. So um, once we have an output like this, uh, a next step that I take to evaluate my systems is using example-based aggregate analysis. And what I mean by this is we look at examples based on different characteristics of each example and uh, try to figure out where one model is overperforming or underperforming compared to the others. So this is comet by the length of the source sentence and comet by the length of the reference sentence. And um, so we can look at where the source sentence is length 2 to 10, 11 to 16, 17 to 23, 24 to 95. 
And one thing that we can note is that the green system seems more convincingly better at short sentences. It's increasing comet is quite a bit larger here. And um, you need a little bit of intuition about NLP systems or how they work in order to figure out like the implications of this analysis. But basically what we can see is that uh, like what I would take away from this is that the green system might be better at resolving uh, ambiguity in sentences because short sentences tend to have a lot more ambiguity in translation because you don't have as much context within the sentence. So maybe the green system is better at resolving this cross uh, sentence ambiguity. The next thing we can do is token based aggregate analysis and um, this is looking at each individual token in our generated text and seeing how well we do. Um, the first one is relative position of tokens in the sentence. The second one is the number of characters in, the in each token of the sentence. And one very interesting thing here is that we can see that the green system is better at short words, whereas the blue system seems to be better at long words. And um, this might, like, let's say we're the developer of the green system, instead of saying, oh, well, we're doing quite well on you know, overall metrics, we're doing competitively or better on overall metrics, why aren't we doing as well on the longer tokens? And longer tokens could be things like technical terms or important entities or things like that. And that would help prevent us from you know, sitting on our laurels and being happy with our results and say, okay, we need to push to do better on this particular task by you know, data augmentation or modeling or other issues, other things like that. Um, we can also look through examples, and uh, I, I just listed up some examples here. Uh, like, for example, here, the green system uh, misspelled a named entity. Um, and uh, here, the, uh, this said a ban on shooting, which is quite confusing when it's actually a ban on photography. Um, so, uh, you know, you can go in and, and find uh, actual examples. And um, we're creating a web platform in open source software to, that makes it easier to do this. So if you're evaluating NLP systems, you can uh, go to the link for uh, our software called Explainaboard. Um, and we also, if you're a data scientist, uh, we can, we have an API based thing that makes it easy to, for example, upload things to this web platform um, and use a variety of different state-of-the-art metrics. Uh, we also have an open source SDK that you can download and use in these systems. Um, so there's still some challenges here. Um, one thing now that I'm feeling a lot is that evaluation is essentially an arms race between uh, evaluation, a generation, and human standards. So we have our generation systems, our generation systems are getting better and better. I've demonstrated that we can use generation systems to evaluate. So we can take advances in generation, feed them into evaluation. Um, and then the advances in evaluation further drive our development of generation or generative AI systems uh, that make it easier to uh, you know, make improvements there. Another thing uh, that I think is very interesting and we're working on is automating fine-grained analysis. So how to discover more interesting behaviors automatically without uh, like manually defining them. And so for example, your model is underperforming on sentences with numerals greater than 5,000. Uh, you know, where did you get this numerals greater than 5,000? Maybe this needs to be discovered automatically from data as well. So that's basically all I had today. Um, I talked about some state-of-the-art metrics, fine-grained analysis. Um, also, if you're working on practical NLP problems, I always love to hear about you know, the issues that people are having um, in this topic or other ones. So please feel free to reach out or, or try out uh, the software that I talked about. So yes, thank you very much. I, I see I have one question. Um, what is the confidence interval on the metrics in these bars? How can we say the differences are actually statistically significant? Um, I, I think the best way to do this is uh, by running statistical significance tests. And um, we have statistical significance tests. They're just not, uh, they weren't uh, shown in the bars. So um, I, I also got a question that if I can share the presentation, I'd be happy to share the slides. I guess I can share it through the organizers and maybe also post it on my, on my website. So uh, yes, I'd be very happy to do so.